whatever happens, whatever the outcome after the May 29th election and um, negotiations of possible coalitions and then the swearing in of a National Assembly and then the election of a president, I'm, I'm, I'm largely confident um, that there is an injection of what I'm seeing in terms of candidates and people who are being put forward as political voices. I'm largely confident we are entering into a new era of a little bit more youthful political engagement in South Africa, regardless of whatever party political uh, stripe. What I'm largely not satisfied with is the, the level of gender parity when I see a political debate or a picture of political party leaders and I see one, maybe two women who are then featured as political party leaders who will ultimately make the decisions for us as South Africans. But of course you remember Lindiwe Mazeboko. Uh, at one time she was the first black and young woman in South Africa to be elected as leader of the opposition in South Africa. And since then she's studied abroad. She's co-founded an organization called Future Elect. It's a non-profit, non-partisan organization that's supporting a new generation of engaged citizens and ethical, political and governance leaders in Africa. And Lindiwe, she joins me at the moment. Let me first uh, touch on um, your late colleague, uh, James Salfi, was a member of your caucus when you were leader of the opposition. Um, his work and contribution goes beyond just what he contributed within the National Assembly and Committee. has been a, uh, uh, often an un, unspoken uh, voice in a liberation struggle in his work in progressive politics before 1994, Lindiwe. Yeah, um, I'm really going to... Um... Well, I'm going to miss James. I missed working with him after I left Parliament. But um, um, like anybody who worked with him, I'm quite distraught um, today because, um, yeah, he was a very misunderstood and largely unknown and invisible figure in South African politics. And the, the amounts that people knew about him was in direct contradiction to how much he contributed to this country. He was a good man. He had a wicked sense of humor. He was wildly intelligent. He was a lot of fun. Um, and yeah, he he sacrificed, you know, mm. the best years of his life to help build this mm. democracy. Um, and now he's no longer with us. Mm. Um, and South Africa is poorer for it. Uh, just on, on, on my optimism on what happens to a South Africa after the 29th of May, regardless of who is elected and who cobbles together a working and hopefully a working coalition to govern South Africa and, and, and provinces around the country. Where do you feel and where do you fall when it comes to what you're seeing in representative politics of particularly young South Africans coming to the fore? Um, I agree with your analysis about there being more young candidates um, and there being a little bit more space for them. Sometimes they've had to fight for it themselves and in other cases. Um, their parties um, have have sort of taken the time to try and bring forward younger voices. So I agree with you. However, the chips end up falling. There will be more young people in leadership roles um, and possibly even in government, um, I think, than in 2019. I also agree with you about women, but it's so much worse than you described, Lester. It's not just the optics. Out of seven, 70 political parties on the ballot throughout the country, one is led by a woman. One out of 70. Um, and although many parties talk about parity, um, that parity always starts with a man. The zebra list always starts with a man. Uh, and so that says something about women as political figures or having political positions, but not necessarily having political power. And I don't think we talk enough about that. In South Africa, we tend to pat each other and ourselves on the back um, and say we have a gender equal cabinet. We have a, an almost gender equal parliament. Um, but what, what positions are women occupying in cabinet? How much actual power do they have? Are they being relegated um, to so-called marginal cab cabinet portfolios? Um, and to what extent are they the masters of their own political destiny, right? Do they depend on men in order to advance through the ranks of mm. their organizations? A really important question as we go to the mm. polls. Uh, just my optimism remains buoyed when I look, social media is not necessarily the the gauge in which I I should be using the appetite for young people's engagement but I am incredibly buoyed by, by, by the level of of understanding 
that, that many young South Africans have in a political system. And we often have the conversation about whether young people are interested in even voting. Yes, there are 13 million young South Africans who haven't bothered to register. Your platform at Future Elect has been to offer civic education, youth engagement. Your thoughts on who you're come, who's coming forward to say, you know what, I want to participate, whether it be on a national level or even if it's on a local civic level, whether it's in my school or my SRC. Are you seeing that appetite from young South Africans? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we designed our civic education program as, as a consequence of demand, actually, um, as a consequence of our own experiences in the organization of young people coming up to us at events, in the streets, at you know, bars <laughs> and bries, and asking the same question. Um, you know, I don't know who to, who to vote for. I don't know how to make voting decisions. And in the conversations I had, Whenever I unpacked the difference between a ward councillor and a PR councillor, it was like the light switched on. Um, and that's when it re when, when, when we realised that because we don't have civic education of any description in our school curriculum, in our university curricula, any kind of civic education, it's actually up to civil society to fill this gap. The IEC has its hands full with voter education, just teaching us not to spoil our ballots, which ballots papers to fill what into and which stations to go to. Um, and that is the IEC's mandate. <clears throat> but in the absence of civic education in the education system, we've got to have civil society organizations doing this work. And the enthusiasm has been unparalleled in every sector of society, but particularly amongst young people. And you can see it in the registration numbers, right? 28 million people are registered to vote, the most in the country's history, and almost 2 million more than 2019. So it's an exciting election from the voters' perspective. Our hope and our work now is about translating those registrations into a high level of turnout. And given what you said earlier, you know, Lester, when people sense changes afoot, they tend to be more enthused about the possibility of their vote counting. So the likelihood of coalitions in the provinces, possibly even at national, I think is going to result in a lot of people turning out. You know, people queued for five hours, uh, six hours at foreign missions to vote on the 18th and 19th. Um, there's definitely an enthusiasm about this election that there has never been before. I agree with you there, Landiwe Mazibuko. Really appreciate your time. Former leader of the opposition in the National Assembly, now co-founder and CEO of Future Elect. Thanks so much for joining us.